last scheduled meeting here, but I'm hoping that uh, revival don't just stop here tonight. I'm, I'm trusting that the Lord would just carry us right on through until he comes right there. I, they just get bigger and better all the time right there. It's going to be a time when we leave this old world right here. We're going home to be with the Lord. Hallelujah. And I can't wait for that time. It's going to be a great jubilee. So y'all stand, help us sing this old song, Heaven's Jubilee. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Coming after you and me in joy is ours to share. What rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise. Heading for that jubilee yonder in the sky. Oh, what singing. Thank you very much. Turn over to page number 49 in your notebooks. Page number 49. I'm still amazed. Yes. <laughs>
my hiding place. <laughs>
David called this morning and asked if I'd sing this tonight. I was practicing at the house all day long. And of course, this one, when she gets home from school, she goes, I'm singing it with you. So what do you tell them? Okay. <laughs>
God bless you tonight. Thank you so much for being here on your Wednesday. 
And for uh, those who are visiting with us tonight, we appreciate you so much for being here, for everybody that invited someone to come. As we asked you last night, thank you for doing that. I invited probably a dozen, I guess, but I don't think any of them came. But Cindy, I did invite her back, but she's here, amen. And, but uh, we are, we just appreciate you inviting folks. And like I said, appreciate folks coming. Uh, what a blessing that this week has been. Uh, so far, and will and does continue to be. I've got several prayer requests, things like that to share with you, but we're going to do that after, uh, before we dismiss, after the preaching tonight. I want you to keep your mind focused on what the Lord would have for us. It's been a blessing to have Brother Keith with us this week. Let's welcome him back tonight. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Austin. And, uh, my, it is a blessing to be in the Lord's house tonight on this Wednesday, and it's good to see all of you, and uh, thankful for the blessings of the Lord, and uh, I don't want to get political, but I just want to thank the Lord for the election last Amen. night. Amen. Praise God. You know, we pray and try to do what we can to try to help our nation and when we make some progress like that we certainly ought to be thankful for it and acknowledge to God that we appreciate the help and so we've still got a lot of work to do and let's just pray and do our part amen it's been a real blessing to be with y'all these uh, services and thank y'all for having me for welcoming me and making me feel welcome and uh, thank you for your prayers, your kind words, and uh, for not stoning me or throwing song books at me. <laughs> that, that's right, that's right. And uh, so we'll keep y'all in our, your, our prayers, and y'all pray for me and Carolyn as we try to serve the Lord and do His will. And uh, there's a lot to do. We'll open our Bibles tonight on this last service for me here in the book of Matthew chapter number 24. Matthew chapter 24. I haven't dealt with any prophecy in these services, but I would like to do that tonight. The Lord be in my helper. And uh, it a Wednesday night, and uh, I feel like I just need to share some things with you here from the Word of God, and it is also about current events. I'm a little hoarse tonight. I've been, uh, of course, preaching, and this is the allergy time of the year for me, uh, stuff of drying up and the dying and all of that kind of stuff, and uh, so maybe I won't get too hoarse and be able to speak for a while. Matthew 24, and if you found your place, would you stand with me in Matthew 24? I want to begin reading with verse number, uh, verse number 4. The Bible says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Play, pay close attention to this next verse. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations, for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Thank you for standing and you may be seated. And may the Lord add His blessings to the reading of His Word. And I certainly covet your prayers tonight. I believe that chapter number 24 is primarily prophecy. I believe that Jesus is describing 
what we refer to as the tribulation period, that seven year time frame that will be on the earth or, or be after the church is taken out. And I believe these verses are describing that. And in verse number nine, I know that I know that as we're Gentiles, and I know as Gentiles, as the a part of the church, that we want to make these verses maybe apply even in our day. And, and I know there is some uh, application, and you can apply probably most any text to your life, but you may have to take it out of context to do so. And so in Matthew 24, the context is he is really speaking to his apostles, and it has a Jewish connotation in this entire chapter, and it is really uh, concerning what's going to happen to the Jew and to Israel. So in verse number 9, when he said, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And here's what I want you to see. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, we know that there has been uh, anti-Semitism, which simply means that someone is against the Jew. There has been anti-Semitism ever since there was a Jew. And all through this Bible, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But on August, excuse me, on October the 7th of last year, these Hamas are, uh, these terrorists uh, went into Israel and killed over 1,200 people and took over 200 prisoner captive and took them down into Gaza. And so far, a little over a year, Israel has been at war with, the, with Hamas that terrorist organization that's based in Gaza with the Palestinians. And then recently they have been fighting Hezbollah, which is a proxy of Iran, and they are stationed or they're in the Lebanon area. And just in the last weeks, Israel has been fighting them. And then we also know that Israel has been in a tit-for-tat with Iran uh, shooting missiles in and they'll shoot some back and now Iran is saying that they're going to retaliate for the latest uh, missiles that Israel sent in to them just a couple of weeks ago. So there's a lot that's going on uh, in Israel tonight. And I want to say this that after October the 7th of last year then we begin to see in the streets of our country these protests and these marches uh, on many college campuses and other places. Uh, these groups that are pro-Hamas, pro-terrorist, and uh, they are, of course, marching against the Jew. And a lot of the Jewish students in some of these places on these universities were uh, persecuted and singled out and mistreated simply because they are Jewish. So there is still today a great anti-Semitic uh, feeling that's in the world today. I want to preach the Lord being my helper for a few minutes tonight on anti-Semitism and the last days. And so what I want to do is to show you, and I want to give you, if I could, and I'm going to have to hurry to make it happen, I want to show you three major reasons for this anti-Semitism. And I want to show you, especially in that third reason, how that it is going to fulfill Bible prophecy concerning the nation of Israel. And I want you to know that what we're seeing today with this anti-Semitism, this movement that has come out, is like I say, it's always been, but 
It's kindly been one of those things that was kept in the closet. But now uh, people are not ashamed nor afraid. They are emboldened to come out against the Jewish people. And so I want you to see how this is going to play out in Bible prophecy. And so what we're doing even in 2024 is that we are witnessing Bible prophecies being fulfilled and leading us up to that uh, even in our day today. Now, I, I'm, to save time, I'm just going to tell you instead of turn to all these verses. In the book of Genesis chapter number 16, you'll find that Abraham and Sarah, uh, God had promised them beginning in chapter number 12 of the book of Genesis, God had promised that He was going to make a great nation out of Abraham, bless his seed, and of course the prophecy of Christ was going to come through that seed. Well, we know that when Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees, he was 75 years old. And then as he and Sarah aged, the son had not yet been born. And so as they began to get older... Sarah told him to go in unto her handmaiden Hagar and have a son by him or by her and then that would be the seed. So in Genesis 16, Ishmael is born. And Ishmael is the son of Abraham and Hagar who was an Egyptian. And we know that Ishmael became the father of the Arabs. The Arabs that are in the world today, for the most part, I know there's another uh, source of them, but for the most part, the Arabs are descendants of Ishmael. So in Genesis 17, God comes to Abraham and Sarah, and this is a year before Isaac is born, and God says to Abraham and Sarah that I'm going to bless the descendants of Ishmael, but my covenant that I'm making with you is not with Ishmael, but it's going to be with Isaac, your son, that will be born about this time next year. And so God did not make that covenant with the, with the uh, descendants of Ishmael, which is Arabs, but He made it with Isaac, which is, of course, the lineage of the Jewish people. Now, what are you saying with all this, preacher? I'm saying this. Right now in the land of Israel, one of the reasons for anti-Semitism, and I call it simply this, the Arab-Israeli or Arab-Jewish conflict. The Arabs want to lay claim to the land that, uh, that the Jews are living in, in the land of Israel. The Arabs want to claim that because they say that their father is Abraham, and because of their relationship to Abraham, that land belongs to them. And so because of that Arab-Abrahamic uh, relationship, they want to claim that that land and Jerusalem belongs to them. But again, God made the covenant which includes the land and all the promises for the nation of Israel, God made that promise to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people, through the descendancy of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's twelve sons, and all the way down. So a lot of this conflict that's in the world today and this anti-Semitism that is being festered out there, it is because of the Arab-Israeli conflict. A Palestinian is an Arab. Now listen, this is a definition. An, a, the, a Palestinian is an Arab that was living in the land of Israel prior to 1948. When Israel became a nation again in 1948. So when they began to go back to the land of Israel, there was Arabs living there and those Arabs are referred to as Palestinians. But after Israel became a nation again, they were other Arabs that left other countries and came to that land in search of a homeland and the prosperity that they believed would follow the Jew coming back. 
And so many of those Arabs identify themselves as Palestinians as well, but they're really not a true Palestinian. And so after Israel, of course, settled the land, then they begin to have to divide, they begin to have to divide up. And many of the Arabs were displaced, taken down to the Gaza Strip where they live. And many of the Arabs, the Arabs control the city of Jericho uh, over on, that's called the West Bank. When you hear the politicians talk about the West Bank, that's the land where the city of Jericho is at. That's controlled by the Palestinians today. And then over in Bethlehem, uh, that's also controlled by the Palestinians. And any time you go in and out of those Palestinian-controlled areas in Jerusalem or in Israel today, you have to go through security checkpoints just like you do at a, at a border, not quite as much, but they're checking for weapons and bombs and people that ain't supposed to be going through. That's what the Jews do. So there's an Arab-Israeli conflict. And I want to say this, that will never be settled. It'll never be settled this side of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our politicians keep talking about a two-state solution. They say that the Palestinians need to be an independent nation in that land. And so what they're proposing is to divide the land of Israel today and allow the Palestinians to create a nation independent of their rule uh, of the, uh, from the Jewish nation. But the, the truth is, the Palestinians are the ones that do not want the two-state solution. The Arabs are not interested in a two-state solution. You say, what are they interested in? They're interested in Israel being driven out of the land annihilated and just completely gone. They want it all. So there will never be peace among the Arabs and Israel. And all Arabs are not involved. Right now, Jordan, the country of Jordan, they're Arabs. They're at peace with Israel. They've got a trade. Uh, with the Egyptians uh, are not Arabs, but they're at peace with Israel right now. Uh, but the Lebanese people up in Lebanon, for the most part, the Lebanese people aren't really uh, that at enmity with the Jewish people, but it is the, the Hezbollah, this, these Arab terrorists uh, that are up there that's creating the problem. So there is an Arab-Jewish conflict, and the Arabs want the land because they claim it's theirs through Abraham. But this Bible gives us the boundary lines for the, for the nation of Israel and God promised it to them and it belongs to them. So that just settles it. Okay, that settles it. The second reason for anti-Semitism in the world today is not only the Arab-Israeli or Arab-Jewish conflict, but it is the Muslim-Jewish conflict. And you say, well, isn't that the same? It it runs, it runs parallel. Most all Arabs, not all of them, but most all Arabs are Muslim. Not all of them, but most Arabs are Muslim. But let me say this. There are other nations that are not Arabs, but are Muslims. And, and uh, uh, two different uh, situations or illustrations of that is the country of Iran. Iran, those people are Persians. Their lineage comes more from the India people and not the Arabs. So our, the Iranians are not Arabs. They're Persians, descendants from, the, from India, uh, but they're Persians, and, but yet they're Muslims. So I hope you see that. And then the country of Turkey. Uh, they are not Arabs, even though they are dark-skinned and, and may speak Arabic and all of that, uh, or the Turkish, but anyway... Uh, the Turkish people are, are from that old Ottoman Empire. They're not Arabs, they're Turkish. But yet they are Muslims. So what is the problem between the Muslim and the Jewish people? I'll illustrate using the top of this table right here. I wish somebody would get that $20. It's been laying there all week looking at me in the plate, you know. I'm not coveting it. I'm just saying every day, every night I'm looking at that $20 bill, amen. <laughs> 
If you go, if you go to the, if you go to the old city at, at Jerusalem, you're going to find an area called the Temple Mount. And that Temple Mount, and I'm going to illustrate this tonight as being the Temple Mount, it's simply a piece of real estate within the walls of the old city. If you're over on the Mount of Olives and you're looking from the Mount of Olives over the Kidron Valley and you're looking at the big walls around the old city of Jerusalem, you have the Golden Gates. There's a cemetery on the outside, an, an Arab cemetery on the outside, and they did that on purpose. And these golden gates are sealed up. Well, right on the other side of that wall is this Temple Mount area. And that's the area where Solomon's temple was at. That's where the temple of, uh, uh, that was in Jesus' day uh, that Zerubbabel had rebuilt and Herod had added on to but it was on that Temple Mount area. But it's, of course, been destroyed. So when you go to the Temple Mount area, it is controlled by Muslims. Yes, I'm talking about in the heart of the city of Jerusalem, within the walls of the old city, the Temple Mount area is controlled by Muslims. In about 650 A.D., uh, there was a, 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 a shrine built on this site and it's the Dome of the Rock. When you look at a picture of the old city the, and you see that big building that's got that gold dome on it, that's the shrine uh, here at, uh, on the Dome of the Rock. And, and that was built in about 650 uh, A.D. And then also on this uh, Temple Mount area, there is a mosque, the El Axis Mosque, and it was built about 705 A.D. And so to the Muslim world, in their, in their history and in their uh, belief, uh, Muhammad, we know Muhammad started the Muslim religion. Well, they believe that in Muhammad's lifetime, he was in Jerusalem, and from this area, this Temple Mount area, he, he on his horse literally just ascended and, and took off and flew off. You know, that's what they believe. And so this Temple Mount area with the shrine and the mosque that is there, this is the third most holiest site to the Muslim religion. The, the most holiest place for them is in, uh, is in Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, because that's where Muhammad was born. And then there's the city of Medina in Saudi Arabia. That's the second most holiest site. But so you've got the Muslim religion, uh, which is just enormous in the world today. The third most holiest site for the Muslim religion is right here in the heart of the old city on that area that's referred to uh, as the Temple Mount area. And to get into that Temple Mount area, you have to go into the old city and then you have to go uh, through a, a, a gate just like you were going into Six Flags or somewhere and they've got security, the Arabs, the Muslims do, and it is controlled by them. The Jewish people cannot go in there. They cannot, uh, uh, we as Christians, you can go into the Temple Mount you can't go into either one of these buildings. We did years ago before they closed them. Uh, but you can go to the Temple Mount. But you're not allowed to pray there. You're, I mean, it's the holy site for them. And so the Jewish people, when you see them praying at that wailing wall, that wailing wall would be on this side of the Temple Mount. The, the exterior walls of the city is on this side. And then on this side is the wailing wall. And so all those Jews, they come over here, they write their prayers on little pieces of paper, and they come up to that big wall, and they stick their prayers in the cracks of that wall, and they'll stand there and pray. The men will have their little hats on. The men pray one area, and the women pray to another area. And the reason they go to that wailing wall is because that is as close as they can get to this area where their temple at one time stood. 
they can't go in there and pray, so they're praying out here. So preacher, what does all this mean? It means that that there's so much tension in the world today among the Muslims and the nation of Israel because the Jewish people, they, that's their land, but they are viewed as occupiers. In other words, the Muslims believe that they are occupying the land that belongs to the Arabs. Uh, the Arabs believe that the Jews are occupying the land that belongs to them. And so these Muslims, uh, they want the city of Jerusalem. They want that land because uh, that is is where their religion is so represented at. But that still, now listen, I'm going to give you the third one. So we see the Arab-Israeli conflict. We see the Muslim-Jewish conflict. But the one that I want to finish up and zero in on tonight and let you know what really underlies all of this is what I simply refer to as the Satan versus God conflict. Amen? The Arab-Israeli conflict is national. The Muslim-Israeli conflict is religious. But the Satan versus God conflict is spiritual. Now I want to say this. In our Bible, every doctrine of the Bible is found in seed form in the book of Genesis. It's just like you take a grain of corn and you plant that in seed form. And as it grows, it comes up, it'll grow, and and at, at the right amount of days, you know, it'll mature and it'll have fruit on it. Well, every doctrine in the Bible is planted in the book of Genesis as a seed. And then as the Bible unfolds, it was given to us, uh, you know, from the days of Moses when he wrote the first five books of the Bible all the way up until about A.D. 95, uh, 95 uh, A.D. when John wrote the book of Revelation. And so in the Bible, all the doctrines that are began in the book of Genesis, they find their fulfillment or their maturity, or the consummation of that in the book of Revelation. And the, Now watch what I'm telling you tonight. The first prophecy of Jesus in the Bible is in Genesis 3.15. And what I want you to realize is that it is more than just a prophecy about Jesus. It is the prophecy about the conflict between God and Satan. Between Satan and Jesus Christ. Here's the prophecy, Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee, that is the serpent, and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed. Her seed is a reference to Christ. So the first prophecy in the Bible that we have of Jesus is a prophecy of the contention that would be between the seed of the serpent and of the seed of Christ. In other words, the seed of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all through the Bible, we find find this warfare that the devil is waging. And listen, he's waging it against God. If you'll remember in Isaiah chapter number 14, uh, this is what it is said of the devil. I, I, hope y'all, I hope I'm not putting you to sleep. Stay with me. In Isaiah 14, this is what the devil said uh, before God kicked him out of heaven. The devil said this in verse 13 of Isaiah 14. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will, this is what the devil thought, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, now watch, above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Here it is now. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like, I will be like the Most High, but yet God said, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. When the devil said within himself, I will be like the Most High. I thought about that, uh, Brother Austin, and the Lord helped me with this just a a week before last. I've, I've preached this before, and I've studied this, but I saw something different here in Isaiah chapter 14. When the devil said, I will be like the Most High, 
and I begin to think, what is God like? What is he talking about? I will be like the Most High. What was the devil, what did the devil see in God that he wanted to be? And three things, I thought of three things. Number one, God is in that exalted position. Can I say this tonight? God is at the top of the ladder. He's on the top rung of the ladder. Every, every creature, every, everything that has ever been created that's got life is below God. Thank God he's sovereign. He's on. And the devil said, I want to be like him. I want to be on the top of the ladder. I want to be exalted. And then I thought about this. A God is worship. Amen. He is worship. His, I, believe, I believe that the animals in their way worship God. You may disagree with me. But I think that even though they're not, they don't have a soul like we do, I think that they recognize a creator in their life somehow or another. God is worship. Men worship him. And the devil is saying, I want to be like that. What did I can prove it? What did the devil say to Jesus over there in the temptation in the wilderness? He said, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said, if you'll fall down in what? And worship me. He wants to be like the Most High. He wants to be exalted. He wants to be worshipped. And then I thought about this. God is not only exalted. He's not only worshipped. But God is in control. He's in charge of it all. So the devil, he wants to be exalted. He wants to be worshipped. And he wants to be in control. If you follow those three things... All the way through your Bible, you're going to find out that they come to a head in the book of Revelation when the Antichrist is ruling this world, amen, during that tribulation period. The devil is empowering him. Humanly speaking, he's at the top. Humanly speaking, he is being worshipped. Every man must take the mark of the beast or, or not be able to buy or sell or trade. He is being worshipped and then he's in control. So everything that the devil said he wanted to be like God is going to come to a head during that tribulation period. Amen. Y'all believe that? I do. Go with me to Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter number 12. I'm trying to give y'all just, I'm trying to give y'all just the thrust of this and so I can get it all in and be done here in a minute. Ooh, I like it. Revelation chapter number 12. See, this, this is the last book of the Bible. This is prophecy. It's chapter 12, we find the, the context is during that tribulation period. And in the context, John is looking back at a woman in verse number 1. And this is a type or it represents Israel. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. If you go back to Genesis 37, 9, Joseph had a dream that the moon and the sun and the eleven stars bowed down and worshipped him. Why, why did he say eleven? Because he's the twelfth. So this is Israel. Verse 2, And she, talking about Israel, being with child, who's the child? That's Jesus God brought his son into the world through the nation of Israel, travailing in birth to be pained, to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. If you go to verse 9, you'll find out that the dragon is the devil, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. If you go into chapter 13, you'll find out that the seven heads, the ten horns, and the seven crowns is a representative of that Antichrist kingdom. So he's talking about the devil uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the workings of the Antichrist during that time. Look what he said in verse 5. And she, that is Israel, brought forth a man-child, that's Christ, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God into his throne. That's the ascension of Christ. 
But look what happens now in verse 7. There's a war in heaven during that tribulation time to come. Michael and his angels fight against the devil, the dragon, and he prevails not. The dragon is cast out, verse number 9, jump down to verse number 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, what does he do? Look now, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. So in the future, you think persecution of Israel is bad now? You wait till these days are fulfilled here on the earth during that tribulation time. The devil is going to turn the heat up against the nation of Israel. What you say, look at this. What happened in, in Jesus' day? When Jesus was born, Herod had all the little kill, children kill trying to kill the Lord Jesus. That's the devil trying to take the child as soon as it was born, just like this text said it was. But I'm saying all this to say this, that what we're witnessing today is the spreading and the outworking of this anti-Semitism that will be prominent and on a wholesale scale during that tribulation period. And my contention is that if we're seeing what we're seeing today, then how close are we to these days of being fulfilled right in front of us? Look what the Bible said in verse 17 of chapter 12. And the dragon was wroth, angry with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant or the rest of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, go with me to Zechariah. Hold your place in Revelation. Just about done. Go with me to Zechariah chapter number 14. And we'll see how all of this is coming to pass. In Zechariah chapter number 14, the Bible says this in verse number 1, Zechariah 14, 1. He says, Behold, Zechariah, next to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. Here's what I want you to see. This is what God says. For I will gather all nations what? Against Jerusalem to battle. Have you ever wondered why? What is it among the nations of the world that's going to prompt them to come to the land of Israel to try to annihilate the Jew? What is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's anti-Semitism. Anybody want, to, anybody want to take a stab at what Hitler did? We all know what Hitler did. What did Germany do during World War II? They killed six million Jews. Why? Because they were Jews. Did you know this? Uh, that beginning in the late 1800s, that Russia began to persecute the Jews. They were thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews that were killed in that late 1800s and the early part of the night of the 20th century in the early 1900s by the Russian people. And that's what started the Jews leaving Russia even before the Jewish, uh, uh, even before the Jews uh, became a nation in 1948. They were 20 and 30,000 uh, 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 at different times coming out of Russia, coming to the land of Israel, fleeing persecution. Did you know that Ukraine, yeah, I said Ukraine, in the early part of the 1900s, they were literally thousands of killed by the Ukrainians and by their army as they persecuted the Jews in the country of Ukraine. And isn't it amazing that God said, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse thee that curses thee. Isn't it amazing, friend, how Germany was humbled and brought to nothing by the end of World War II? And isn't it amazing that Russia and Ukraine are spilling each other's blood on that soil over there? And I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you that what God says in His Word is sooner or later coming around and coming to be fulfilled and a lot of the stuff that we're seeing today is because of the way that the Jew was treated in the past. Amen. 
So God said, I'm going to gather all nations against Jerusalem. The Antichrist is going, after the church is taken out, let me pull it all together. The Antichrist is going to come on the scene. He's going to establish that one world government. And by the middle of that tribulation period, he's going to break his covenant with the nation of Israel. He's going to do away with the false church and, and, and all that even the Jews are going to be able to worship their God uh, the way they do in that first part. But he's going to eliminate all of that. He's going to set himself up as God and demand that all the world do what? Worship him. What did I read you in Isaiah 14? The devil wants to be worshipped. He wants to be like the Most High. Everything, when we think about the kingdom age, we're thinking about a time when Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, is going to rule this world uh, as a man for a thousand glorious years. But during the tribulation period, uh, the devil wants to imitate that. Uh, the devil wants to mock that. The devil wants to duplicate that with the Antichrist ruling. In other words, everything that God's going got laid out for this planet and for the people on it the devil wants to imitate that and duplicate that because he wants to be like the most high God and the center of all of this attention who is it that Jesus listen who is it that Jesus came into this world through through the nation of Israel who what group of people is Jesus going to be the king over the earth through he's going to sit on the throne of David and rule the Jews Jewish people for a thousand years and they're going to be the head and not the tail and their kingdom will be the kingdom that, that really uh, he uses in the world. And so the devil wants to do away with the Jewish people because they're not only God's people for the past, they're God's people for the future and the devil wants to annihilate them and to get rid of them, amen, for his purposes and for his cause. Go to Revelation 19 and I'm done right here. How many times have I said that? Preachers don't lie, except when they're in the pulpit. Revelation 19. Look what we find. This is the same. What you're reading in chapter 19 here is the same thing of Zechariah 14. Look what he said in verse 19. Jesus comes in this text. And he said, And I saw the beast. That's the Antichrist. And the kings of the earth. That's right. The kings of the earth. And their armies. Gathered together to do what? To make war against who? The Jews. That's not what it says. Against him. But in Zechariah 14, the text says, I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem. The battle. So this takes us back to Genesis 3.15. God said, I'll put enmity, enmity, talking to the serpent, which is the devil, use the serpent. I'll put enmity between thee, between thy seed, and the woman's seed. That struggle, that fight. So here's what I believe happens. As that tribulation period comes to an end, the nations of the world with this anti-Semitic attitude go to the land of Israel to annihilate the Jew, to finally do them in. And according to Zechariah 14, half of the city will be taken, the houses, the women are ravished. I mean, I mean it's just going to be a, a terrible time. And when it looks like all hope is gone, Jesus is going to come back. Zechariah 14. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives and fall and fight as he did in the day of battle. That's what he said. So they, they come for the sake of annihilating the Jew. But here's what happens. When they get there, according to Matthew chapter 24, I know y'all have read this, and then shall appear the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in the heaven. He talks about the moon and the sun. He talks, about, he talks about the cosmic signs that precede the coming of Christ. 
I can't tell you exactly what that's going to be, but this I believe, and this is what the Bible is saying. When it comes time for Jesus to come back, there's going to be something that takes place in the heavens. And every eye in the world will know what it is. It's going to be the announcement of His coming. I ain't talking about the rapture. I'm talking about the second coming. It's going to be the announcement of His coming. And that sign and those signs, I believe, will begin to appear as the armies are gathered in Jerusalem to battle the Jewish people. And then when those signs begin to appear, it is announcing the coming of the Son of Man and they turn their attention away from the Jew and upon the coming of the Son of Man. And that's where the war then turns against him as it is in Revelation chapter number 19. They're gathered to make war against him. So that enmity that began over in Genesis 3.15 comes all the way through the Bible with a Pharaoh that wants to annihilate the Jews with a Haman that wants to annihilate the Jew, with Herod that wants to get rid of Jesus, comes all the way through the Bible of people being against the Jew and against Christ, but it's going to find its final fulfillment in the, in the end of the tribulation period when the devil's armies will be gathered to exterminate the Jew and Jesus himself comes back and they'll turn their attention against him and think that they're going to be able to fight him. He won't even have to lift a finger with a word of his mouth. He'll destroy the armies and set up his kingdom and rule for a thousand glorious years. And the good thing about it, I'm about to have a fit, and the good thing about it is that you and I will rule and reign with him, uh, amen, for 1,000 glorious years. And then he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth and we'll just be with him throughout all eternity, thank God. Isn't it good to be saved tonight? Hallelujah. But right now, right now, it's all disguised with that Arab Israeli conflict. It's all disguised with that Muslim Jewish conflict. It's all disguised in other reasons that man may have in hating the Jew. But according to my Bible, we really know what's behind it all. And it's all going to come to a head. And Jesus is going to win. During that tribulation period, if I read Zechariah 13 correctly, that about two-thirds of the Jewish people will die. But they're going to come out on top. And I ain't, I'm talking about Jews. They're going to have to get saved just the same way you and I did. There ain't no automatic salvation for anybody. don't matter what, what, what people group you are. But I just, I just want us to be aware the Bible said, Jesus said this. You, he said, you can, discern the, you can discern the sky, talking about the weather. But can you not discern the signs of the times? So let's not be, let's not have the shades pulled down over our spiritual understanding. I was thinking today over there in 1 Peter, or, or 2 Peter, anyway, in, in the book of Peter, where he was talking about, what people are saying, you know, I've heard the second coming all my life, all my life. And, and, all, and, and, and they make the statement, all things continue. In other words, everything's been the same. And I got to thinking, Brother Austin, about, about change. Right now in America, you know, I don't know what's going to look like with the new administration coming in in January, but it gives me hope that maybe we'll have just a little reprieve, a little reprieve and a little help. But there's been dispensational changes all through that Bible. And we know that there's coming a change. The church is going to be taken out. And that dispensation of that tribulation period is coming. And we know there's going to be that kingdom age after that. 
And all this rise in anti-Semitism is playing in to the prophecy of how the devil is going to put the Jew in the final crosshairs and finally upon Christ himself. And that's where that this Bible ends. So it works its way just like that little, you drop that one grain of corn, comes up as a stalk, it gets up there and it goes to putting the, the tassel and then, then the ears begin to make and then that stuff falls down on the silk, you know, and germinates and all that. And then you go out there and you pull those big roast ears off, you know. And that's the way these Bible truths are. They're in seed form. And as you go through your, your Bible, there's more and more revealed. But by the time you get to the book of Revelation, it's full, it's ripe. And in, in Revelation 14, John hears that angel t announcing the coming, the second coming of Christ. Actually, chapter 14 is a description of chapter 19 of his coming. And he's, he's telling him to, to thrust in thy sharp sickle, for the earth is ripe. And I'm telling you, neighbor, all this sin, all this wickedness, all of this weird stuff that's going on in our world today, it just means that this thing's getting ripe for judgment. We're headed to the book of Revelation. All of that's true and all that's real. But the most important, the two most important questions that pertain to every one of us tonight are these two questions. Number one, am I saved? All this is wonderful, but your biggest question is, are you saved? It ain't what, it ain't what the devil's going to do there, and are you saved? The second biggest question is, if you are saved, are you where God wants you to be in your walk with him? See, I, I, I love prophecy, and all that's wonderful. But my two greatest questions to my life, am I saved, and then am I where I need to be? We're standing all over the house. Y'all come with a song. Pastor's going to stand out here. And I don't know your heart tonight. You may be watching online. I don't know your heart. But you need to answer those questions in your life. Are you saved? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a believer? And then if you are a believer, this, this is not hope so or maybe so. All this is going to happen. It's going to happen. But still, the most important thing to me right now is, number one, am I saved? And then number two, am I where God wants me to be in my life? How, how are you answering those two questions tonight? And I hope you knowing a little bit of some of this is going to happen. I hope that motivates you, as I preached last night, to get you to think, about where you're at. Let's see. Maybe you just want to come and pray for whatever reason. Pray for someone. Pray for your own self. Whatever. You do it tonight. He's coming. I hope we're ready.